Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Millicent from Walker. Russia says its forces continue to destroy Ukrainian artilleries on multiple locations, while the armed forces of Ukraine, AFU, claimed it repelled Russian attacks from different settlements. The Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konoshenkov said that the Russian army eliminated Ukrainian military equipment, including ammo vehicles and howitzers, in directions of Kupiansk, Krasny, Lemen, Donetsk, South Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Russian air defense facility shot down four rocket-propelled projectiles launched by HIMARS, MLRs, and five Ukrainian unmanned aerial vehicles near Lugansk, Kharkov region, and Kherson. While the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine reported that Ukrainian forces repelled Russian attacks from 14 settlements near Donetsk and Lugansk. What Ukrainian missile and artillery unit struck a Russian control point, three assembly points and a fuel depot. Ukraine says for the first time it confirmed that it destroyed a new type air defense system of Russia and this was in the Kherson region. In the meantime, air raid sirens sounded in Kyiv and across Ukraine as EU leaders and Ukrainian officials gather in the country's capital for a summit with President Vladimir Zelensky. However, there were no immediate reports of Russian missile strikes. Over a dozen top European Union officials visited Kyiv to promise military, financial and political aid and to show support for Ukraine before the first anniversary of Russia's invasion. Air raid sirens across Ukraine. In the meantime, the gathering in Kyiv is the first of such since the war began February 24 last year. It follows new Western pledges of arms deliveries to help Ukraine resist an expected Russian offensive. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen promises that the EU will stand with Ukraine for the long haul. Europe has been by Ukraine's side since day one because we know that the future of our continent is being written here. We know that you are fighting for more than yourselves. What is at stake is freedom. This is a fight of democracies against authoritarian regimes. Putin tries to deny the existence of Ukraine, but what he risks instead is the future of Russia. Our presence in Kyiv today gives a very clear signal. The whole of the European Union is in this with Ukraine for the long haul. And we will stand up for Ukraine as we stand up for the fundamental rights and the respect of the international law. And today Russia is paying a heavy price as our sanctions are eroding its economy, throwing it back by a generation the price cap on crude oil already costs Russia around 160 million euros a day. And we will keep on turning up the pressure further. We will introduce with our G7 partners an additional price cap on Russian petroleum products. And by the 24th of February, exactly one year since the invasion started, we aim to have the 10th package of sanctions in place. And Russia must be held accountable in courts for its odious crimes. Prosecutors from Ukraine and the European Union are already working together. We are collecting evidence. And as a first step, I'm pleased to announce that an international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression in Ukraine will be set up in The Hague. Well, for more about the biggest European Union delegation being sent to Ukraine, joining us to talk more about this is Deutsche Welle correspondent Marie Sinner. Uh, she joins me from Berlin. Marie, what signal does the EU want to send uh, with this visit? Well, let's just say it's usually not part of an EU commissioner's job description to travel to a war zone. Nevertheless, the U.S. has sent 15 of its top-notch commissioners to Kiev, uh, in addition to the president of the European Commission and the president of the European Council. And this is also the first 
ever EU summit to be taking place in a war zone. The summit could have taken place remotely. It could have been held in a different location, but instead it's being hosted in Kiev. So it's safe to say that this is a historic moment and a big gesture of support and solidarity. The signal is clear. The EU stands with Ukraine. And Marie, do we know, uh, you know, have more information on all the package that will be available for Ukraine, what Europe is offering Kyiv on this trip? And Ursula von der Leyen has announced, for example, that there will be a 10th round of sanctions on Russia before the one-year anniversary of the invasion um, that will take place later this month. Um, and in addition, there has been more financial aid announced, uh, for example, financial aid for energy equipment. The EU wants to fund uh, millions of LED light bulbs to prop up Ukraine's damaged infrastructure. So those are already some concrete commitments um, that were made yesterday. Yesterday. But one a big topic that has yet to be covered is um, Ukraine's membership application for the EU. So far, there have been no specifics on this topic uh, yet. Ukraine wants to join the EU, and since last June, it is a formal candidate to do so. Uh, and the Ukrainian side has been venting an idea of an expedited time frame for this membership application process. The Ukrainian prime minister spoke of two years. That would be incredibly fast. And that's unlikely to happen from what we are hearing from the EU side. Visitors from Brussels are expected to pour cold water on Ukraine's hopes for swift membership. And many wonder if Ukraine indeed has, you know, the realistic chance of becoming an EU member state in, in the near or even midterm future. In the near future, no. And that's because becoming an EU member state is a long process, even in this unique case. For example, the last country to join was Croatia, and it joined a decade after applying. Ukraine's neighbor, Poland, took 20 years to join the European Union. So the Ukrainian prime minister's goal of two years seems unrealistic. Um, and that's because Ukraine needs to prove its laws and institutions are on par with the rest of the EU. That includes sectors like healthcare, education, and corruption. Now, the Ukraine has already made strides in corruption reform uh, since its application process began. That was also noted by von der Leyen yesterday, but it's still a long road ahead. And adding to that, the EU has made clear that it won't emit a country that's at war. And at the moment, there are, of course, still troops on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, for example, Emmanuel Macron, the uh, French president, said it will take decades uh, for Ukraine. Ukrainian membership to become a reality. So membership in the near or even the midterm future is unlikely. And this visit is also really about managing these mismatched expectations. And Marie, you know, about a thousand kilometer east from Kiev, Vladimir Putin was marking the 80 year anniversary of a battle that turned the tide in the Second World War, uh, the Battle of Stalingrad. It saw the Soviet army capture nearly 91,000 German troops in a major turning point of the war. During his commemoration speech, President Putin drew parallels between uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine to fight against Nazi Germany. What message do you think he was sending? Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin was sending a clear message of war propaganda. He said that uh, Russia is being again threatened by leopard tanks. He was referring to the leopard tanks that the German government um, is planning on sending to Ukraine to defend the country from a Russian invasion. Um, and this is really not the first time that um, Russian President Putin draws on these World War II parallels in order to find justifications for its invasion. He He's, um, he's mentioned empty comparisons um, and uh, alluding to Nazism before in order to justify the war in uh, Ukraine. And the reason that he's doing this is really he wants to switch the narrative. He wants to find a new narrative. The narrative that observers here are following is that Russia has invaded Ukraine twice in eight years. And that's not because there is a, a real threat from Germany, from the EU or from NATO, but that's because the Russian president Vladimir Putin does not want to see an independent Ukraine. And as the war continues to escalate and he needs to gather support from internally from within Russia, he's drawing on these emotional um, moments in Russian and in world history, drawing on World War II to try to find support for this modern day war that he uh, is leading.
Marie Sinner, thanks for that update. Uh, Marie Sinner is Deutsche Welle correspondent joining us from Berlin. We we'll move on to other stories. Latvian Prime Minister Chris Janis Karin says Turkey, Kazakhstan and Armenia are being used by traders to avoid European Union sanctions on Russia. Speaking after a discussion with Estonian and his Lithuanian counterparts, he says the three European Union countries were among the most vocal supporters of the bloc sanctioning their neighbour Russia in response to its invasion of Ukraine last year. To see countries such as Kazakhstan, uh, countries such as Armenia, countries such as Turkey, where certain kinds of trade is going up very high, disproportionate to what it has been in the past, and it seems quite clearly that traders are finding ways to legally trade goods, say with Turkey or with Kazakhstan or with Armenia, which are then re-sent to Russia because these countries are not adhering to the sanctions regime. We cannot run the risk of ever tighter sanctions and then ever broader uh, loopholes of companies and individuals trying to avoid them. So we need to start focusing on the uh, secondary effect of sanctions avoidance. It can be done, especially if we do this on a European level together. Our intelligence, as, as the Ukrainians have, have said it out as well, that uh, Russians are planning escalating even more to commemorate this, uh, this uh, one year or to show something that they have gained something during this war. We know this habit of Kremlin, of a particular uh, weirdness to uh, attach uh, some importance to numeric things. But uh, I, I don't think that should change our behavior in any way because uh, 23rd or 25th or 11th or 10th, we still need to do the same. We need to uh, ensure that support uh, is delivered to Ukraine and Ukraine can win the war. The Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov rejected a hoax media report that U.S. CIA director William Burns had traveled to Moscow with a secret peace proposal that involved Ukraine ceding a fifth of its territory to Russia. The Western media's report, which said Burns had made a secret trip to Moscow last month to put forward the plan on behalf of the White House, has also been dismissed by Washington. Asked whether Mr. Burns had traveled to Moscow or put forward a plan that involved Ukraine. Ukraine ceding 20% of its territory, the Kremlin spokesman said that whole report is a hoax. Staying with the Kremlin, it says an EU embargo on Russia's refined oil products that will come into force on Sunday would further unbalance global energy markets. The ban is the latest stage of Brussels' plan to cut the vast majority of Russian energy supplies to the 27-member bloc and reduce the billions of dollars that Moscow earns globally from its hydrocarbon sales. Russian officials have said they will not sell oil to any country that abides by the $60 a barrel price cap on purchases of Russian oil imposed by the European Union, the group of seven major economies and Australia. India and China have not imposed sanctions on Moscow for sending its armed forces into Ukraine. They've stepped up their purchases of cheaper Russian oil over the last year as Western countries have drastically cut their imports. Ukrainian armed forces concluded three days of military tank drills in northeastern Kharkiv region as the country's senior military official warned of possible Russian assault from all fronts. Oleksiy Danilov, secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, told Ukrainian and international media that he does not rule out another attack from the north, south and east around the date of February 24 the day Russia launched a full-scale invasion in Ukraine. Military experts say Moscow appears determined to push forward in the coming months before Kyiv receives hundreds of newly pledged Western battle tanks and armored vehicles for a counterattack to recapture occupied territory this year. The aim of tank drills was to increase troops' readiness in case of another Russian assault on Kharkiv region. And it's more drills for Ukraine's armed forces. They conducted this one in Chernobyl exclusion zone next to the border with Belarus. The drills involved Soviet time self-propelled howitzers called 2S3 at Katsisiya and aimed at increasing troops readiness in case of another Russian assault from the territory of Belarus. 
Chernobyl nuclear power station was seized by the Russian forces in the first days of the invasion, and they withdrew from the territory of the defunct plant by the end of March. Elsewhere, the Baltic nations and Poland have called on international sports bodies to ban Russian and Belarusian athletes from competing in the Olympics and other events while the war in Ukraine continues. Sports ministers from Latvia and Estonia said they were in dialogue with sympathetic Nordic countries to build a coalition of support for the proposal. The International Olympic Committee announced last week that athletes from the two countries banned from competing in Europe might be allowed to earn slots for the Paris 2024 Games through Asian qualifying, although the IOC later said it was standing by sanctions imposed against Russia and Belarus. That we condemn uh, this uh, um, statement that the International Olympic Committee made about the uh, athletes of the aggression countries and we say very straight out that for us, um, we don't agree that the sport people from the Russia and Belarus will take part of the Olympic Games. If we talk about at all uh, boycott, then this is the last solution. And I think right now it's not time to speculate too much about that. We said very clear that even we had the connections in the culture and in the sport field, that after this war, we also stop those cooperation before the war is ended and we don't continue before the war is ended. We can't say right now uh, that the Olympic or uh, sport is something where we can say this is not connected or this we avoid this uh, question there. I think right now everything is for us connected with the war and if we can show the place to the Russia and Belarus, then we have to do that. Um, together with uh, ministers from Estonia, Latvia uh, and Poland, uh, we have agreed uh, that uh, uh, on our joint statement against the inclusion of Russian and Belarusian sportsmen into international sport uh, events. And uh, we will continue working also uh, discussing with our Nordic colleagues in order to expand our coalition and uh, to condemn the efforts of uh, International Olympic uh, Committee uh, for their efforts to bring Russian and Belarusian sportsmen into international competition. I think that that's very clear that uh, they are aggressors. The war is going on in Ukraine and Ukrainian sportsmen, men and women, they are dying currently. And uh, um, at the same time, we are discussing that uh, um, sports women from, women, men from aggressor countries, Russia and Belarus, can participate in the competition. And I don't know if you would imagine that we can compete with uh, Ukrainian sportsmen.